much for joining us on this day. This is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to ask our online people to please share this video with your family and friends. Thank you all once again for joining in with us for service for the Lord. Our scripture is going to come from Jeremiah 39. Verses 15 through 18. Jeremiah 39, 15 through 18 in the New Living Translation version. And it reads, the Lord has given the following message to Jeremiah while he was still in prison. Say to Ebed Molech, the Ethiopian, this is what the Lord of the heavens army, the God of Israel says. I will do to this city everything I have threatened. I will send disaster, not prosperity. You will see its destruction. But I will rescue you from those you fear so much. Because you trust in me, I will give you your life as a reward. I will rescue you and keep you safe. I, the Lord, have spoken. God and there is no other God like our God. When God tells us something, guess what? You can take God's word to the bank because when God speaks, his word is going to come true. If you have not been studying your Sunday school lessons these last few months, you have been missing out on powerful truths from the word of God. The Lord tells Jeremiah, who was one of God's prophets, one of God's mouthpieces, who told the people what God told him to tell the people, and that Jeremiah was beaten, he was thrown in jail, he was put in a cistern of mud for just obeying God. So when we obey God, sometimes we're going to go through trials and we're going to go through tribulations. But you know what? That's all right. Jeremiah in verses 17 and 18 he says because you obeyed me and did what I told you to do he said I'm going to rescue you from those who you fear so much he said because you trusted me I'm going to give you your life as a reward I'm going to rescue you and I'm going to keep you safe and then he says I the Lord have spoken okay when God tells us something, y'all, you can believe that. If God tells you you're going to be healed, you can believe that. If God tells you he's going to give you a job, you can believe that. So if I haven't learned anything else over these past Sunday school lessons, I have learned that blessings come from obedience. And disaster comes with disobedience. It is much better to trust and obey God, whether it's your friends or those in power. God's word is to be trusted. Why is his word to be trusted? Because God will do exactly what he says he will do. God said he was going to burn Jerusalem down. If you don't obey, he was going to kill people. And guess what? God did just that. God is the great God. If you can't see God for who he is now, one of these days you're going to really see God for who he is. His name is the name above all names. He is worthy of our praise. And everybody will see how great our God is. The verse says, the splendor of a king clothed in majesty. He wraps himself in light. And guess what? Darkness. They're going to try to hide from God and tremble at his voice. But there is no way darkness can even hide from God. How great is our God? The splendor of a king. Clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. All the earth rejoice. He wraps in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great
God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come. We thank you for another privilege. We thank you for another honor. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, for keeping us in spite of us. Keeping us in spite of our disobedience, in spite of our meanness, in spite of us not doing the things that you would have us to do. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Lord, we know you are the God of hosts. We know you are the God of Israel. We know you are the God of Houston, Texas, and this world. We pray, Father God, that you bless us to hear your word here today. That your word will give us strength. Your word will give us hope. Your word will give us deliverance. Your word will give us redemption. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise. And for that, we thank you now. We praise you now. We honor you now. We magnify you now. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you for what you do. We thank you for how you allow us to be who we are. And Lord, we praise you here today. Now, Lord, we ask you to have your way in this place. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen. 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 And thank God. Verses 15 through 18. Jeremiah chapter 39. Verses 15 through 18. I want to thank God for Brother Kevin Whitlock and Brother Ewan Miles for making this text real. Thank you for your daily reading of the Word of God so you have prepared your heart for this Word. Jeremiah chapter 39. Verses 15 through 18. I gave you 21 points last week. I, I owe you some time. I understand. <laughs> Let me give you five and I'll leave you alone today. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 39, verses 15 through 18. Now the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to 
Ebad, Mechem, the Ethiopian saying, thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Behold, I will bring my words upon the city for adversity and not for good, and they shall be performed in that day before you. But I will deliver you in that day, in that day, says the Lord, and you shall be given into the hand, you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely deliver you and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you because you have put your trust in me, amen, amen. says the Lord. Brother Isaiah, fix, fix me over here. I want to talk about the promise keeping God. All right. The promise keeping God. The promise, the promise keeping God. 2016 gave way to the election of a brand new king in the United States of America. It was a king like never before. It was a king who calls himself a king. He carried himself as if he was a king. He deserved in his eyes pat on the back as if he was king. He talked bad to women. He misused them. He thoroughly abused them. And he made sure you understood that I am the president. I can do what I want to do. That kind of rhetoric gave confidence to those who had been hiding under white sheets and cone hats. All right. It gave confidence and emboldened men to, to forsake the hats and take off the sheets. All right. It emboldened men to, to make sure that they trained their little girls and little boys to hate people that didn't look like them. It's because when a king that is ungodly king well, in charge, then the people mourn and the people suffer. Yes, sir. But when the righteous is in control, All right. yeah. then the people rejoice. Yes, sir. Amen. For some four and a half years, people have not rejoiced really in the United States of America. Well, and because of this one president, January 6th took place and has gone down in history. January 6th, 2021 has gone down in history of that day where they were at ground zero acting a fool. Now they call people from our neighborhoods hoodlums. Or they choose to call them hoodlums. But the fact of the matter is, none from our neighborhood have scaled the walls of the Capitol in great numbers as you saw on January 6, 2021. Let me just say to you, there's always some of us in the midst. There's always somebody that want to be a part because they think that the ice is cooler on the other side of the track. Because they believe that the water tastes better on the other side of the tracks. So they begin to find themselves even caught up in the Capitol riot. Knowing that there will be judgment for them that is different from the judgment for others. It's because of an unrighteous leader in charge. I want to say to you today that whenever, whenever the unrighteous and the ungodly is in charge, we will continue to moan. Well, the righteous will moan. The unrighteous will moan. The difference is that the just shall live by faith. Yes, sir. When we look at the world events that we have today, I had a moment to sit down and watch the great debaters on yesterday. 
And that was a quote that stuck in my mind and will forever reside in my heart. The question that the leader of the great debater played by Denzel Washington would continue to ask the debater of young people at Wiley College, Marshall, Texas. The year was 1935. Wiley College, a little bitty college in Marshall, Texas, had rose to fame because of their debating skills of these young African-American children. The question was, who is the judge? The answer is, God yeah. is the judge. Yes, sir. The question was, why is God the judge? And why is God God? Why is he God? Because he decides who wins and who loses. Right, Not my opponent. Yeah. Right. Who is my opponent? My opponent doesn't exist. My opponent does not exist. Why don't my opponent exist? Because he is a merely descending voice of the truth I speak. I think every young person in the room, every young person that is listening, need to know this in their heart, that God is the ultimate judge. Yes. Right. That God has the last word. I told you some years ago that God is going to put uh, Mr. Trump on blast. I, I told you some years ago that you can go on and do your shenanigans and, and do all of your carrying on, but sooner or later, as bold as you are, God is going to put you on blast one day because God is the judge. Why is he God? Because he decides who wins and who loses. Such it is, such it is in the text today. In the text, we realize that God is God. My first point to you today, and I'm I'm almost one fifth through already. Uh, my first point is there's a reality that we must face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the reality, the reality we must face is that God is God, and He's God all by Himself. Yeah. The text declares in verse number 15, now the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison. Let me tell you, even when you're in prison, God can speak with you. Even when you're locked up and locked down, God is able to see you because he is God. The reality that we must face this morning is that God is the omnipotent God. He, he knows everything. He sees everything. He watches everything. He is the omnipotent God. The second thing about God, he's an omnipresent God. He, he is, I'm just talking about the reality. The reality is the God that we serve is an omnipresent God. Everywhere God goes, he bumps into himself. When he goes to the east, he bumps into himself in the west. When he goes to the north, he bumps into himself in the south. He is God all by himself. He is an omnipresent God. He is God. The psalmist says in Psalm 139, if you go to the depths of hell, God is there. Yeah. If you go to the earth, God is there. If you go make your way to heaven, God is there. Everywhere you go, there is God because he is an omnipresent God. The next thing I, I want to tell you about God is he's an omnipotent God. Meaning he's an omnipotent God. Meaning that he's an all-powerful God. He's an almighty God. The devil may be mighty, but the God that we serve is almighty. Yeah, 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 he's yeah. an omnipresent God. He, he's an omnipotent God. He's all-powerful. He is an omniscient God. Meaning that, that he is the God that knows everything. The final thing I want to share with you is that God is a sovereign God. He does what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, to whom he chooses to do it. He is a sovereign God, and it plays out right here in the text. It played out on the campus of Wiley College. This little small African-American college had no reason, had no idea, had no deserving right to debate at Harvard College, but they beat out the famous Harvard College in the great debate. Yeah. 
says to us today, young people, young people, God has chosen you for such a time like this. That's why those of us who are of age need to do all we can, while we can, do it now because young people are following us and they are pushing us on out of the way. And we ought to be willing to get out of the way. We ought to be willing. That's why you can't live out your life through your children. You need to do all you can while you're here, while you got breath in your body, while you're able to put one foot in front of the other. You need to do all you can right now. You need to encourage your young people to be about their father's business, to be about doing things that make a difference because the reality is God is the judge. Why is he the judge? Because he's sovereign. He does what he wants to do with whom he chooses to do it. Verse number 16 says, go and speak. He says, go and speak to Ebed Meacham. That's been pronounced several ways. If I tore it up, it's all right with me. You go in and speak to him. And when you speak to him, I want you to give him this report. My first point was there's a reality. Yeah. And that reality is that God is in control. Yeah, yeah. That reality is God is God. My second point is there's a report. All right. Everybody in this room, one of these days, you're going to get a report. All right. And not all reports are good reports, Sister all right. Brown. All right. Not all reports are reports that you really want to hear. Not all reports, Sister Powell, will be a report that you can brag about. One of these days, you're going to get a report from the doctor that says, I can't handle it anymore. It's all left up to you and your God. One of these days, you're going to get a report that a bill that you didn't even deserve is, is over $100,000. And now, how can your bill get to be $100,000 when you're not able to use electricity, when the electricity is shut down? Now, the bill you've been paying $50 a month, now it's shut up to $5,000. It's because people will use you during this supply and demand. The report, the report may not be good. All right. And whenever you have a prophet, right I'm just so sick and tired of these prophets. Oh. Prophets have a way of reporting all good things. Yeah, they want to tell you, oh, by in the morning, you're going to be blessed and highly favored. By in the morning, money is going to run you down. By next week, you're going to have your budget and your bank account overflowing with money. I say to you, if you work on this week, next week you'll have some money in the bank. I prophesy, I prophesy that if you work and you give your life to your work, if, if you work for money, I prophesy in the name of Jesus that you will have money in two weeks. I, I prophesy if you work for it, you have some. Money doesn't fall out the sky. Stop letting folk take your money to tell you a lie. That they take your money and you pay them to lie to you. <laughs> Oh, I mean, people sit in front of the TV and it's been going on for many, many years that, oh, you, you come to this Coliseum and you get in this line and, and you can receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, if you're saved, well, if you're born again, the Holy Spirit is already a part of you. He is in you. He resides in you. When you invited Christ into your life, he came in also. The Holy Spirit, he came in also. It's a shame where I can give a good report, a truthful report, and money goes somewhere else. <laughs> it's a shame. It's a shame that people will pay people to lie to them and talk bad about people who tell them the truth. The great debaters will tell you. If the great debaters are here, they will tell you that there is no real enemy. The enemy is a mere descending voice of the truth I see. We need to understand that, that this great debate of group from 2007 would tell us today that we have known the enemy, the devil himself, and that enemy has nothing to do with God. God is able to handle the enemy. You, you may not be able to handle him. That's why we can't get so holy until we think we got it going on and we think we got caught blanche on the block 
when it comes to the devil, the devil wants to sift you as sifting wheat. But the good thing about it, good thing about it, good thing about it, Jeremiah had a good report. <laughs> The report, the report will come and sometime you will have a good report. Don't you want a good report? Don't you want the, doc, the same doctor that said I can't do anything to walk back in the room and say to you that I didn't do it. It had to be some anomaly. I, I like when they say it was an anomaly. What well, anomaly means that it's a one-off. That means it happened and we have no real record of it happening. I love when they say it's an anomaly because the fact of the matter is God specializes in doing the impossible. He, he specializes. He, he, he will give you the report. And he will give you the report that you've been looking for. How many in the room today have had a report given to them? And the report that you received was not from the doctor, but it was from the Lord himself. You see, God has blessed men. God has blessed men and women to be intelligent, to be smart. They are able to matriculate through education and, and make sure they do the right thing for your body. But there's a limit to them. I just told you that we serve an omnipotent God. He's the God that's all powerful. He's the God that does everything. And you want the report of God. Yes. Jeremiah comes with the report. He says to Ebed Meacham, the Ethiopian, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring my words upon the city for adversity. I will bring my I will bring my word upon the city. See, God says, if you obey him, I'll bless you. If you disobey him, I'll curse you. He didn't, he didn't say, he didn't say, he didn't say not one time that your blessings is based on somebody else mistreating you. He didn't say one time that if you obey me because they treated you right, I will bless you. It says, if you obey me, then I will bless you. The report here is that the, the Lord himself, the God of Israel, the God of hosts says, that behold, I will bring my words upon the city for adversity. You see, God has a way of turning you over to your enemies. God has a way of, 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 of allowing your enemy to cause destruction. And see, the, the, the God of Israel was the God of a rebellious people. The Israelites would always get in good with God by obeying him, and then they would turn their backs on him and walk away from him. You remember when they told Moses, Moses, we don't want to talk to you anymore. We want to talk to God ourselves. And we want God to speak up for God's self. As if God wasn't able to speak up for himself. But when God sent lightning and he sent thunder. And he opened up the ground and swallowed a few of them up. And gone by his business. They said, God, we want to hear from Moses now. I, I beg of you. I beg of you to, I, today. I beg of you to hear the voice of the preacher. I beg of you to hear the voice of the man of God. I beg of you to hear the voice of the one that is the mouthpiece for God. Because you don't want to be found in the hands of an angry God. It's a difficult thing. You can't survive in the hands of an angry God. God has had mercy on us. God has blessed us. God has given us grace. And he's given us favor. And here you go because you holy. You want to call God to the carpet. Job tried it one day. Job, Job, he, he was the greatest man in the land of us. Job was a man that, that was really after God's own heart. Job made intercession for his children night and day. Job prayed before the Lord, and the Lord still allowed the devil to attack Job. And when he got to a point where he looked like he was going to lose his life, he called God on the carpet. Who are you to call God on the carpet? Job, Job was saying, look, God, I wish I had not ever been born. After God got sick and tired of sick and tired and sick and tired of hearing from Job, God, the Bible says that the, the clouds rolled back 
And God began to confront Job on the own carpet. And Job had to repent right then and there. The, the report is, the report is that there will be this destruction and there will be devastation all around you. The city will be taken out. Let me just stop and tell you that the report is that not it will not be for good, but it will be for devastation. It will not be for good, but it will be for bad. <laughs> it will not be for good, but it's going to be something you don't like. See, that's how prophets talk. Prophets will tell you, yeah, you're going to be blessed, but prophets, the first thing about a prophet is that what he prophesies come true. Yeah. The second thing about a prophet, they lived in the Bible days. Yes, sir. You get that. You get that by the time you get in the car. Uh, the, the third thing you got to know about a prophet, he won't always tell you what makes you feel good. The fourth and the fifth thing about a prophet, you need to understand that the thing about a prophet is whatever he says is going to come true. And whatever he said, if he casts down destruction, destruction and destruction is on the way. Yes, yes. Too many prophets making people feel warm and fuzzy. Yes. I mean, they, they come upon you and they don't know how you are with God. You didn't, they don't know how your fellowship is with him. But they want to see you prosper and be glorious and something to brag about. But the moment that the camp meeting is over, they got your money and they go down the road to the next coliseum. When you look at Jeremiah, Jeremiah make a promise to this Ethiopian that there will be adversary not for good it's going to be for bad and i shall perform in the day before you in other words jeremiah and in other words ebed leachum meet you i you gonna see it happen <laughs> the, the new living translation says it like this i'm gonna perform it in front of your very eyes i'm gonna perform it right before you i'm gonna perform it and you're gonna see it Look at what God, the report is, there will be devastation and destruction, but you're going to see it and not be touched by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at what God, I, want, I just told you that he's a sovereign God, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm still talking about the report. The reality is that he's a sovereign God, but the report is you're going to see the destruction. Yeah, yeah. And in the midst of seeing the destruction, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you, that's good news. The preacher ought to carry some good news. Yeah. Every now and then, the preacher ought to give you some good news. Every now and then, regardless of how bad things are, the preacher ought to tell you, you're going to make it if you stay with the Lord. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. You're gonna, I'm, I'm talking to somebody right now. You're going to make it. But you got to stay with the Lord. I, I can prophesy all day that everybody in the room, everybody on the broadcast, everybody going to make it. But I want to tell you, if you're going to make it, you're going to have to stay with the Lord. You're going to have to stay with him. You're going to have to trust him. You're going to have to walk with him. Because if you walk with him, your report will be good. Yeah. Now, I just want to tell you, just because you're born again, just because you are a Christian or a Christian, you ain't going to have every day sunny. Every day for you will not be a bright and sunny day. Every day will not be a day that the boys back home used to sing about. I got sunshine on a cloudy day. Even in the month of May. And you ask me how I know. And you ask me why I feel this way. It's not my girl, but it is my God. It, it's my God. It's my God that makes my day sunny. That makes me have sunshine on a cloudy day. You see, sometimes God calms the storm around the child. Other times, God calms the child in the storm. And you see, the storm can be going on all around you. Disaster can be happening all around you. But you can watch it happen, and you can be calm in the storm. But see, we want Jesus. Every time our storm comes up, we want Jesus to stand on the top of the ship and say, peace be still. And then we can go and tell folk and brag about how God has blessed us and blessed us, and he ain't blessed you. But many times, God will allow us to go through the storm just to see if you're going to be calm in the midst of the storm. The report, the report is that there's going to be devastation. There will be, there will be adverse situation. You're going to see it. But you won't. 
be touched. Let me let me go to my third point. My third point is that there will be rescue. There will be a rescue. There will be the great rescue. Look at verse number 17. But I will deliver you rescue. I will deliver you that day, says the Lord. And you shall not be given into the hand of the men who, of whom you are afraid. He says, I'm going to rescue you. He says that, that I'm going to keep you. I'm talking about the God that keeps his promise. He, he says, I'm going to keep you even when you think you're going down the drain in the hand of the men whom you are afraid of. In other words, you ought not fear your opponent That's right. because your opponent is a, just a descending voice. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a descending voice yeah. of when we speak the truth. Let me tell you, you better speak the truth. Speak the truth because God can rescue you. Speak the truth and stand on the truth because God can rescue you. One, one, preacher, one preacher was talking about he's standing on the wood. He took his Bible, he threw it on the floor, and he stood on his Bible. After the sermon was over, I said, brother, that ain't going to get it there. You can stand on it all you want to. You can stomp on it if you have to. You can hold it next to your breast if you want to. The fact of the matter is, until you crack that Bible open that you're standing on, until you trust in the word that God has given you, you're just going to be a fleeting moment in a passing thought. God will rescue us. God will rescue us. God, in the midst of all the trauma, in the midst of all the turmoil, let me tell you, almost 600,000 people in America alone already dead from one virus. And look at us sitting in here. It's not because we've been so good. It's not because, it's because of God's amazing grace. It's because of God's mercy. It's because of what God has done for us. It's not because of what we've done for God. You know, Christians have a way of bragging about what they've done for the Lord. <laughs> Oh, I've been on this journey for 40 years. I used to watch folk back home say that. I've been on this journey for 40 years. And I'm saying as a child, and you ain't done nothing yet. <laughs> Absolute, that's not good English, but, it, but you understand. You haven't done anything in those 40 years. All right. I've, been a, I've been the president of the choir for 50 years. And I said to myself as a little boy, that's why the choir is dead right now. Because you did. You know, I couldn't say that back home. I, I couldn't say that as a little boy, you couldn't talk to grown folk the way young folk talk to grown folk today. Yeah, you're right. No, you're right. You couldn't, you couldn't say anybody in the church would correct you. That's right. And then anybody in the church correct you and they tell mom and dad about it after they beat you. And then you said, Mama, that ain't true. She said, oh, she lying, huh? <laughs> oh, 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 Mr. Dixon lying, huh? Oh, you're right. I mean, Deacon Dixon, Deacon Singleton, Deacon Chance, Deacon Lord, these, Deacon Beckworth, these men kept us in line. All right. In town, in the marketplace, <laughs> at home if they drove by. They told us what we are gonna get when we mowed the yard and 90% of the time it was nothing. <laughs> it's because we live in a different paradigm today. And in the midst of this different situation, children have learned some stuff that they got from across the border or somewhere. But God has a way of blessing us and he will not turn us over into the hands of our enemies. The, the report is that he's going to rescue you. The report is he will deliver you and you shall not fall. My next point is there's a reward. It's in the text. It's in the text. Verse number 18 says, it says for I will surely deliver you and you shall not fall by the sword. For your life shall be your prize, will be the prize to you. This word prize, it means your reward. He's saying, God has said, while other folk are dying around you, I'm going to spare your life. And your life will be your reward. Your life will be your prize. 
You know, young folks saying that, well, mommy, if you don't get me these shoes, or you don't get me this car, if you don't get me this mascara, if you don't get me this hair, then you don't love me. Let me tell you, love doesn't come in mascara and hair. Love doesn't come in nails and cars. Love doesn't come because you can poke out your lips. 21-year-old boy decided he wanted a Mercedes Benz for his birthday. For his 21, for 21st birthday, he wanted a Mercedes Benz. His mom and daddy surprised him with a brand new BMW. Stack brand new right off the lot. This little small brat had the nerve, the audacity, the gall to take a brand new car, BMW, and drive it into water over his head, get out the car and walk away from it. It wasn't an accident. He deliberately sunk that car under the water and told his parents, I didn't ask for a BMW. I asked for a Mercedes Benz. I said right then, he grew up in the wrong household. I said right then, if he was in my household, first of all, he wouldn't drive a BMW. You see, folk that get new cars, they buy their own new car. When you're not working, when you don't own stuff, when you don't pay bills, you don't get new cars. You get cash cars. And when you start working, your money pays for the cash car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This rascal sunk a brand new BMW on purpose. And had the nerve, the gall to look in his parents' eyes and say, I told you I didn't want that. I wanted a Mercedes BMW and you got me a BMW. That's why I did it. Lord have mercy. I can see Head Davis right now. I mean Matt Davis, Mathis, Mathis Davis right now. They call him Head back home. I can see him right now. See, because when I graduated in 83, I got a brand new 78 Ford Zephyr. A Ford Zephyr that they don't even make anymore out there. A Ford, I got a brand new 78 Ford Zephyr. I said brand new. It was brand new to me. It was brand new to me. And I was jumping for joy when daddy handed me the keys at the Coliseum. I wouldn't dare say I don't want this because I know it would have taken God to deliver me. It would have taken God to save me. It would have taken God to create a safe haven around me and I surely would have needed God to rescue me. So your life your life is your reward. Maybe we need to start telling our children, your life is your reward. If, if I graduate, what you going to get me, your life? I fed you for 15, 18, 19, 20 years. You got your reward. But we don't talk to our children like that. We don't tell them, welcome to the real world. This is what really happens in the real world. In the text, the prophet, the man of God, Jeremiah, says to the Ethiopian, he says, for I will surely deliver you. I will rescue you. And I will surely make sure that you don't fall by the sword. I will rescue you. Your life is your prize. Your life is your reward. And this is the reason why. Because you have put your trust in me. Because you have put your trust in me. At the end, at the end of the great debater, there was a 14-year-old that was hanging out. He, he was in college. He was 14 years old. He was a son of a preacher. And this great debater, he, he was an alternate. And after so many hundreds of debates that they won, he told the debater coach, look, when am I going to get a chance to debate? He said, I'm sick of this, man. 
I'm tired of sitting on the side watching those two debate. All right. And lo and behold, when he got to Harvard, when he got to Harvard, he, uh, he, the coach couldn't go because he was on probation. So he put the, the, the gentleman over them that has been a part of the debate and the night before the debate as they were studying, he, he advises and tells informs the 14 year old, man you up tomorrow at the Harvard University. Yeah, you up tomorrow with all of these faces out there that look nothing like you. Uh -huh. You up tomorrow in the front of a high pressure crowd and he looked like me? And he asked him the question, haven't you trusted me to now? Can you trust me again? So in the great debate, as it came to a close, this little 14 year old on a college campus stood and challenged the other debaters and the trophy went to Wiley College in 1935. Marshall, Texas. Right. The trophy went to Wiley College. Uh, they beat out Harvard University. Yeah. Yeah. And they won 10 more first place trophies for the next 10 years. Uh -huh. It says to us young people, we got to trust God in our lives. Yeah. I know your friends got good ideas. I know they, I know they say they're going to be with you, but you better start trusting God. When things look hard, when things look difficult, you need to trust God. When we reflect on January 6th, the king of the crowd told them we're going to march down to, to the capital. And he said to them, I will be with you. Let me tell you, the limousine wasn't long enough for him to jump into. The, the walk wasn't short enough for him to walk back to the White House. He said, I will be with you. Yeah. Do not put your trust in any man. Right. Put your trust in God. Yeah. My last point, and it's right here in the text, is there is a redemption. When you have messed up, when you put your trust in God, God has a way of redeeming you. You can keep his promise. If he says he's going to be with you, he is going to be with you because he is a promise keeping God. He will redeem us. He says that this is what I have spoken. I have spoken this. I said it myself. I said it all by myself. I will be with you through thick and through thin. You can put your trust in him. You can trust him. He has already redeemed us. He's brought us back. He has brought us back. Oh, he did it over 2,000 years ago. On a Scott Hill called Calvary. He gave his very best. He redeemed us over 2,000 years ago. They hung his son. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. They dropped him low. He died on a Scott Hill called Calvary. It was for our redemption. He has redeemed us again. He's brought us back. After he died, they speared him in his side. Out came blood and water. Thank you, Lord. This blood was for the redemption of our sins. Thank you, Lord. He redeemed us yes. on a skull hill called Calvary. Yes. The devils thought they had him. Let me tell you, the text declares that the people that you fear the most, you don't have to fear them again because God is with you. The devil thought they had Jesus. The devil thought they had Christianity. But out of that third day morning, he got up with all power. All power in heaven and earth in his head. He has redeemed us. He has brought us back. He has brought us back. Thank God for Jesus. He did it on the old rugged cross. It was an old rugged cross. It wasn't a perfectly built cross. It wasn't a perfectly shaped cross. It was an old rugged cross. We were putting our, our 50 foot cross out there. It's really 60 feet tall. It's 10 feet of that cross in the ground. So when the wind blows, it won't knock it down. 
And when we dug deep, water started flowing out of the aquifer. So I said to the man, hurry up and stab it in there. Before it fills up with water, we'll pour the cement around it. And we don't have to even bring water because it will supply its own water. God is supplying the water. And you know, Sister David is kind of a perfectionist, you know. All right. I told the man to stab it in there. She told me, well, it, it's, it's kind of crooked. I said, brother, stab it in there. He's trying to straighten it up because she said it was crooked. I said, if you straighten it up, we won't get it in there at all. Stab it in there. The water's coming out too fast. Stab it. He dropped it in there in the cr with the crane. And, and if you look at that cross very closely, that 50-foot cross is kind of leaning. After we got through going back and forth, I said to Sister Davis and to the heavy equipment operator, this is a symbol of what Jesus did. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't a perfectly shaped cross. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, it, it wasn't a, a, a neatly wrapped cross. All right. It wasn't a cross that measured 50 feet on this side, 50 feet on this side, 50 feet in the ground. It was an old rugged cross. All right. And if the cross being an old rugged cross was good enough to save me. Yeah, yeah. Certainly it's good enough to save somebody else. Yeah, yeah. So when people pass up and down sure my road, yeah, yeah. when they pass up and down 288, when they pass up and down Beltway 8, yeah. they look across here and they don't see a perfect cross. Yeah. They see an old rugged cross. Yeah. The reason why it's important to note that it's the old rugged cross because our lives weren't straight. We were messed up. And some of us still messed up. But the old rugged cross that they hung Jesus on was sufficient to satisfy God. Jesus became our perpetuation for our sin. This word perpetuation means that God got satisfied we were atoned by Jesus' death on the cross. There may be somebody here today that has not trusted Jesus. God says, you can trust me. He died on the old rugged cross. They laid him in a brand new tomb. And on that third day morning, he rose from the dead. This is your moment. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Come to Jesus just as you are. Your life may be in shambles, but Jesus died on an old rugged cross. And because he died on that cross, you can be saved right here, right now. The door is open. Will you come? If you've not received Jesus as your personal Savior, will you join me and invite him into your life? Just repeat after me this short little prayer. Just believing that Jesus is the Son of God. In our obedience unto God, He gave His life as a ransom for you and me. Will you bow your head with me and repeat after me and invite Jesus in? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that you prayed this prayer. We believe that you're born again. You're on your way to heaven. We believe when you die, you will you will be wrapped into the 
with the church. We believe that you died. You will meet God in heaven. There may be others of you who fit into this category of many of the Israelites. And that is you wrestle with sin. Sin is a part of your life. And you just can't shake it. You just, every time you would to do good, sin captivates your attention. This is your moment. I want to pray with you. Will you rededicate, recommit, reassure your life in Christ Jesus? Father God, I pray for those who struggle with sin. Your word says every time we were to do good, sin is present with us. I pray that you deliver, rescue in the name of Jesus. Redeem, bring back those who have fallen away from you. Bless them in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. There may be others of you who are in between churches, don't have a church home or in between church homes. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain. I recommend that you join the New Beginning Church. You don't have to live in Houston. You don't have to live in Southeast Houston. You can be globally aligned, but you need to be in church. If it's right to be in church, it got to be wrong to be out of church. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. That's their home. Every person needs a church home. Will you trust him today? Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of the New Beginning Church. If you've received Jesus Christ during this broadcast, in, inbox me and let me know that you've received Jesus. We want to rejoice with you. We want to make sure that you are a part of this great family of faith. If you've chosen a New Beginning Church as your home, inbox me and let me know and I will send you out all the materials you need to become a formal member, an official member of the New Beginning Church. For those of us who are struggling, as I do with this thing called sin, we want to continue to pray with you. Be good to hear from you. And let me pray with you. God bless you. God keep you. It is now offering time. It is offering time. Hallelujah. It is time to give to the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. It is time to give to the Lord. 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 It is offering time. It is offering time. If you need an envelope, raise your hand and you will be served. Um, they are sitting right in the doorway. As you come in, you can get one. But if you missed it, if you missed that, that uh, podium right there in the middle of the doorway, raise your hand and some of these young people will serve you. They'll be glad to serve you. It is offering time. And for those of you who are joining us by broadcast, you can also give in two or three ways. You can give to the New Beginning Church. Those in this room will be given by way of envelope. If you do have an envelope, please, ma'am, please, sir, do, do not seal your envelope. Just tuck it in there and it, it won't fall out. The second way to give is give by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com that's our sale account or you can mail your tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts in to the New Beginning Church P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Five four seven seven four five nine seven seven four five nine. Thank you so much for joining us here today and giving to the New Beginning Church. I want to ask this side if you would stand. If you would stand on this side, please stand. Follow the beautiful young lady from the rear to the front. Bring forth the Lord's tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts.